Okay, good morning, everyone. So let's get our class started. Oh, sorry, actually give me about 30 seconds. I need to send something to the other class groups. Oh, actually, uh, Pak Hendra, can you send the, um, uh, the the today's presentation to the other class, to the regular class? I forgot to send it to them as well. Okay, Pak, I will, I will send it later. All right, thanks. Pak Wawan, I am not able to share. Okay, sorry. I think you can now. Okay. okay. All right. Good. Okay. So as I have mentioned um, in the end of our last week's meeting, so we are now in chapter number two. Okay, and this is on industrial fuels. Okay. There you go. Right. So uh, and there's a. Um, what I want you guys also to uh, to appreciate, at least uh, by the end of this class, is that we're trying to organize the the materials uh, in a logical sense. So, uh, so there's a good reason why we put uh, industrial fuels at the beginning of class, because really you cannot run any chemical processing plant without some sort of um, energy, right? And the easiest way to generate energy, as we have discussed last week, is to combust is by the combustion of fuels. Okay. Uh, so inevitably, uh, in that sense, well, we need to have a good uh, basic understanding of the chemistry and the design of combustion system. Okay? And the way we, uh, we redesign this uh, utility systems class in this year, so combustion system discussion will be deferred. It will be integrated with, uh, with the discussion on boiler systems. And in this week, we are only focusing on the fuel itself, okay? some basic combustion chemistry and also uh, on reviewing the um, industrial fuel itself okay so if you guys somehow uh, have received materials from last year's class this year uh, this chapter is a little bit short uh, it's about two-thirds of what we taught you guys uh, you know your your kaka angkatan last year because again we're moving some part of it to another chapter okay so uh Thermal energy supply, the reason why we require uh, fuel and the reason why fuel is so essential, is absolutely critical for uh, the, the operation of any chemical processing plant, is that we need actually thermal energy supply for many purposes. Okay, So for example, if we want to conduct chemical reactions, uh, even though if the even if the reaction is um, spontaneous, for example, uh, even if the reaction is um, exothermic, we need uh, the thermal energy supply to at least ignite the reaction mixture to its reaction temperature before it can start spontaneously. Now, let alone uh, endothermic reactions, which require a continuous supply of heat, right? Um, we also need thermal energy to, uh, to induce phase change of materials. For example, we want to vaporize something, we want to fuse or melt some material, then of course we need uh, thermal energy, process plant startup, um, adjustment of material or stream temperatures and many many more okay so virtually it is impossible to design a chemical processing plant without thermal energy supply okay now thermal energy sources are uh, are not actually uh, that variable um, so we don't have too many choices when it comes to thermal plant thermal energy source um, the most common one is of course combustion of fuel okay uh, this is the conventional way of um, supplying thermal energy to chemical processing plants. We can also use nuclear reactor, although this is very rarely practiced for chemical processing plants uh, anywhere in the world. Okay. Uh, solar radiation and so on. Solar, radi uh, solar radiation, this one is also still, uh, I would say this is still in research phase, okay, uh, because um, solar radiation is not available in high temperature. So if we, if our reaction required high temperature, Usually this doesn't work. Okay, 
So again, the most widely used uh, in process plants is combustion of fuels. Okay, and heat generated by fuel combustion is utilized to for uh, direct heating of process fluids or heating of trans uh, heat transfer fluids, for example, steam. Okay. Right uh, on the right hand side here, we can uh, I'm inserting some example of uh, thermal equipment uh, in chemical processing plants. So uh, on top there, we call these units uh, fired heaters. Okay. Uh, or sometimes people call, also call it industrial furnace. Okay. So what happened in these vessels is a uh, combustion of fuel. So this, uh, this line, this, these small lines uh, at, the, at the midsection of the, uh, of the vessels. So these are lines or jalur. Okay. So these are lines for fuel. Jadinya adalah jalur bahan And inside the vessel, uh, what happens here is combustion of the fuel into thermal energy and then the, uh, the second question is, of course, what do we use? Uh, uh, what do we do with the generated thermal energy? So we can uh, actually circulate heat transfer fluid around this, uh, around this uh, thermal heater or process heater, rather, sorry. And that heat transfer fluid can be transferred into any point in our chemical processing plant and perform heating elsewhere. Okay. Or uh, if it's direct heating, then it is the process fluid piping that is uh, inserted into these combustors okay into these furnaces so we call that direct heating okay direct heating meaning uh, means uh, that the heating process does not involve heat transfer media okay again uh, as we have discussed last uh, week heat transfer media can include steam pop air or it could include uh, it could be in the form of uh, specially designed organic fluids okay uh, sometimes people call it thermal fluids yeah or um, heat transfer fluids okay uh, hot oil is another popular term for it so basically a hot oil is um, organic compound which is typically liquid at room temperature to high temperature that can be heated up and then circulated throughout the plant uh, to heat up the process streams Okay. All right. Uh, now some kind of, uh, discussion on combustion chemistry. So combustion, of, of course, oxidation of fuel by uh, either pure oxygen or air or anything in between. Okay. It could be oxygen enriched air as well. Uh, combustible elements in fuel that contribute significantly to heat combustion under practical conditions. Okay. Are these three elements? So carbon, hydrogen, and sulfur. Yeah, of course, uh, please uh, underline the word here under practical conditions. At extremely high temperature, uh, extreme, yeah, extremely high combustion temperatures, nitrogen in fuel can also be ignited. It can also be combusted into nit uh, nitrogen oxides, NOx, okay, NOx. But, uh, you know, that's, people usually don't like it, okay. <laughs> So uh, when we say combustible elements in fuel, uh, we usually refer to these three elements, yeah, tika unsur ini, carbon, hydrogen, and sulfur. Okay, now, uh, what do we need to happen? Or what do we need to have to ensure complete combustion? Okay, first one is sufficient supply of oxygen as required by the fuel, of course. Yeah, uh, as we see later on, um, we have a thing that's called a, a, a stoichiometric air, meaning the amount of supplied oxygen is exactly as required by the stoichiometry of the combustion. And we also have a real combustion, which typically require air above the, uh, the stoichiometric amount. Yeah. So there's always an excess air that is required by a real live combustion system. Yeah. Again, that is an important uh, that is an important jargon and concept there. Excess air. So excess air is the amount of air above the stoichiometric air. Okay. All right. So when we say sufficient supply, do not imagine that sufficient supply means stoichiometric air. It has to be above the stoichiometric air. Okay. Intimate mixing between oxygen or air and fuel, and really one of the one of the purpose of uh, having an excess air is actually to uh, to promote intimate mixing between the oxygen and the fuel okay just like any chemical reaction so uh, you can of course you can view um, combustion as being just another chemical reaction where we need um, a good mixing between the reactants in this case the reactants are the fuel and the air 
Okay. Uh, the third one, oxygen and fuel mixture temperature has to be above its flash ignition temperature or flash point for short. Okay. Again, uh, drawing an analogy to just re any regular chemical reaction. Okay. So you need to bring the temperature of the chemical reaction above a certain temperature in order to induce the reaction, okay, to ignite the reaction. And the last one, combustion chamber has to be sufficiently large to allow sufficient contact time. So you need some time, okay? So you need some time to uh, to make the combustion reaction complete, yeah? So in short, we need sufficient amount of oxygen, good mixing between oxygen or air and the fuel. Uh, we need to bring the temperature of the combustion mixture above its flash point, and we need to have uh, we need to give them enough time to complete the combustion. Okay, so the combustion chamber has to be sufficiently large without being, of course, ex uh, too excessive in terms of size. Yep. And below here are some definitions. Uh, so the flash point is the lowest temperature at which a saturated fuel vapor is ignited by an open flame. So flash point always refers to fuel vapor. Yeah. The theory is that um, fuel combustion does not happen. Uh, sorry, let me read, uh, redraw that. Fuel combustion always happens in gaseous phase. Yeah? Even if we're talking about um, solid fuel, kayu bakar, for example, okay, wood fire or coal. Okay, so when we combust the coal, actually the combustion does not happen in the bulk phase, bulk solid phase of the coal, but some volatilization of combustible material has to be has to happen first okay and then it is this uh, vapor the volatile vapor that's the one that is combusted by the air yeah same thing with liquid fuels okay so uh, a liquid fuel has to be vaporized first or atomized first before it can be ignited okay before it can be combusted yeah let me repeat this in indonesian so uh, if any of you is not uh, didn't understand what I just said. Yeah. Um, pembakaran itu terjadinya pada fase uap. Apapun wujud dari bahan bakarnya, mau bahan bakarnya gas, cair maupun padat, pembakaran selalu terjadi pada fase uap. Jadi misalkan kita membakar sepotong batu bara, ya, maka Pembakaran itu tidak terjadi di dalam fase padatan curah dari batu bara itu, tetapi batu baranya harus dipanaskan dulu sehingga komponen hidrokarbon yang mudah menguap itu menguap terlebih dahulu. We call those uh, category of compounds volatile uh, volatile content. Jadi uap yang muncul di permukaan batu bara ini yang kemudian terbakar. Yeah. Not the solid coal itself, but the vapor which is produced by the heating up of the coal. Yeah. So the second one, auto ignition temperature, which is temperature at which fuel vapor is spontaneously combusted without ignition by flame. Yeah. The above temperatures are related, uh, are related to the fuel vapor pressure. Yeah. So again, the ignited phase is actually the fuel vapor, not the fuel, not the liquid or solid uh, phase of the fuel, but the vapor. Yeah. And this is the famous um, combustion triangle. Okay, so uh, you will encounter this symbol um, quite a lot in the lab, in laboratory works, also in safety. Okay, either uh, both laboratory and process safety. This is called combustion triangle. So you need a confluence of events. So you need a sufficient amount of oxygen, you need temperature, and you need the presence of fuel in order to uh, to carry out the combustion process. Okay, so if you want to prevent combustion then you have to prevent the formation of this triangle, the coming together of the elements of this triangle. Okay. Sir? Yep. I have a question, sir. Uh -huh. So is it true that uh, if you want to combust something, then the flash, the flash point will always be larger than a specific materials uh, boiling point or something, sir? Because you said it has to be vaporized first, right, sir? Mm -hmm. Is that true, sir? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, uh, you're correct. So the flash point of any fuel vapor will be above its point. Well, uh, 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 no, not really, <laughs> uh, because 
now this is a, this is going back to thermodynamics class actually. Um, you can vaporize a material below its boiling point, right? Am I right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, um, so when we talk about flash point, we're only focusing our attention on the fuel vapor itself. Okay. So um, if a mixture of fuel vapor and air can be ignited uh, by an, by a spark, yeah, dengan lecutan uh, bunga api, so that's called the the flash point. Okay. And that um, uh, you're right in part. Okay. Uh, in the sense that higher boiling point fuel typically has higher flash point. That's typical. Okay. But the flash point, the temperature at which its fuel vapor is ignited, is typically below its boiling point. Yeah, because at boiling point, what you have is complete vaporization of the fuel. This is uh, this is especially true for um, uh, liquid and solid fuels. Okay, gaseous fuels um, because gaseous fuel doesn't have any boiling point, so their flash point. Uh, you know, we cannot really relate the boiling point and flash point for gaseous fuels. Okay, thank you, sir. Yep. Okay, uh, and okay, so this is a good example on the uh, on the right hand side here. This is uh, flash point of gasoline is minus twenty three degrees Celsius, right? And and you, as you can see, uh, as you can relate from your daily experience, the boiling point of gasoline is of course much higher than minus twenty three. Okay, right. <laughs> Otherwise, you cannot pump. You cannot conveniently pump gasoline to your vehicle. Okay, so the boiling point of, if I remember correctly, the boiling point of gasoline is about, uh, I think it's eighty degrees Celsius. I think, but the flash point is much lower than boiling point. Okay, because uh, at much lower temperature, we can vaporize uh, gasoline. Okay, and compare that to diesel fuel on the right hand side. Yeah, so um, gasoline. At room temperature, okay. Uh, if you, uh, sorry, not room temperature. If you uh, lit a match, yeah, lit a match uh, above, above a pool of vaporizing gasoline, then it will instantly catch fire. But if you do that with diesel, because diesel has a much lower vapor pressure, then it has a much higher flash point than gasoline. So you cannot ignite diesel fuel this way. Okay. You need a higher temperature in order to uh, to ignite gasoline. Uh, sorry, diesel fuel. So what you do if you want to ignite diesel fuel is that you have to dip the burning match into the pool of diesel oil, diesel fuel. Okay. Again, for gasoline, you don't have to do that. For gasoline, all you have to do is to bring the match. If you lit the match above this, you know, this pool of uh, vaporizing gasoline, and you'll ignite everything. But if you want to ignite diesel fuel, then you have to dip the match into the liquid diesel fuel in order to ignite it, because diesel fuel has a much higher, a much lower, sorry, much lower uh, vapor pressure. Higher pressure? Yeah, much lower vapor pressure than gasoline. Yeah. Okay. So uh, <laughs> just a side story. Um, so next time you see a Hollywood movie where you know somebody uh, shoots the, the the fuel tank uh, of a vehicle and the vehicle explodes, that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, it depends on what fuel is being used by the vehicle. If it's gasoline, yeah, okay, it might happen. But if the if the vehicle is a diesel powered vehicle, for example, of trucks or buses, then it's highly unlikely that you can expect to shoot a bullet into a into diesel tank and it will ignite because uh, diesel fuel is actually quite difficult to ignite yeah and that is the reason why industrial engines okay industrial uh, piston engines almost always use diesel fuel they almost always use diesel engines instead of petroleum engines okay because it's much safer for industrial environment okay it doesn't really. Uh, it matters less for uh, you know our daily or for uh, personal use uh, vehicle. You, you can see from from our everyday lives that the number of vehicle uh, that we use actually we have more number of a higher number of gasoline vehicle compared to diesel vehicles because uh, you know uh, when we when we deal with just a small amount of fuel uh, contained in these vehicles, then it's uh, it's not such a big hazard. Uh, 
when we compare it into industrial engines, large, you know, really heavy industrial engines. Okay. All right. Um, this is combustion stoichiometry. I think uh, I believe you have uh, discussed this in, even in, in your um, Kimia Dasar class in the PP. So just a quick overview. Um, this is this represents the fuel. Okay, again, um, C, H, and S. These three are the uh, the combustible elements. Okay, so these are the elements that are involved in combustion reactions at normal temperature, at normal uh, combustion temperatures, okay? Um, and so on and so forth. So you can, you know, th th this is this is a no-brainer. You can read about this on your own. Um, da, 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 da. So what I, okay, this is the one that I would like to highlight, okay? So this is a theoretical air requirement, okay? Or we call it stoichiometric air, yeah? So, um, so uh, stoichiometric air requirement is always calculated from the ideal version of combustion stoichiometry, meaning this kind of equation. Okay, it doesn't involve any excess air. Yeah. All right. Um, however, in real life, okay, in real life, if we insist on just using stoichiometric amount of air in our real life combustion, then what we will end up is with is a non-ideal combustion in which the product contains carbon monoxide and also residual fuel. Okay. And this is really bad for two reasons. The first one is that this implies that the heat production is not maximized. Okay. Because we still have residual combustible elements or combustible compounds. Carbon monoxide can be combusted, can be oxidized further into carbon dioxide, resulting in energy. Okay, so carbon monoxide is actually a fuel. Yeah. And uh, not only that, these gases are typically toxic. Okay, so carbon monoxide is toxic. Uh, fuel itself is also toxic at higher amount. Okay, so uh, non-ideal combustion is not a good, uh, not an ideal situation to have. So we need to have a complete combustion. Yeah. Complete combustion means that all of your fuel, all of the combustible elements, all of the combustible uh, compounds are oxidized. Okay. And to achieve ideal combustion, to achieve complete combustion, you need more than stoichiometric air. Okay. So uh, again, stoichiometric combustion is only a theoretical concept. There's no way in real life that you can achieve complete combustion using only stoichiometric air. Yeah. All right. The next one is uh, fuel analysis. Okay. So when we um, when we discuss about fuels, um, we always um, talk about fuel analysis. Okay. Analysis of fuel comp uh, fuel composition is necessary in in order for us to be able to calculate the um, uh, the mass and energy balance of the combustion process. Okay, we need to know uh, the fuel composition in order to estimate its heating value. So, how much heat? Okay, jadi berapa banyak kandungan energi dalam satu satuan massa atau satu satuan molar bahan bakar? Okay, so that information can only be gained by fuel analysis. Okay, analysis bahan bakar. Yeah. Now there are two approaches when we analyze. Fuel analysis uh, when we perform fuel analysis, okay, proximate analysis and ultimate analysis, okay. In practice, these two types of analysis are done in different types of uh, specifically specially designed furnace. Yeah. Jadi analisis proximate dan analisis ultimate ini dijalankan dalam uh, furnace yang didesain dan distandarisasi secara khusus, okay. There's an ISO standards, okay, or ASTM standards for these types of analysis. Okay, now approximate analysis measures only these uh, parameters. Okay, they measure moisture, kadar air, how much water is contained by the fuel. Okay, um, volatile matter. Uh, the the Indonesian term for it is kadar zat terbang. Yeah, zat terbang means um, hydrocarbon that can be volatilized at rather low temperature, okay, several hundred degrees Celsius. 
and then after we um, after we volatilize the the volatile hydrocarbons, what remains is called fixed carbon, carbon tetap. Okay, uh, this would look something like charcoal. Yeah, and then proximate analysis also measures the amount of sulfur inside the fuel, the amount of ash. Ash is the mineral content of fuel, yeah, abu. Okay, so when you combust a piece of coal or a piece of charcoal, for example, after you're done with your combustion, you will get this residual ash. Okay, abu. Right. Uh, let me give you an example of what abu looks like. Okay, I think I might have something. I think I have some lying nearby in my house. Uh, hang on a second. Okay, so uh, so two days ago, I'm uh, I'm burning incense uh, dupa, okay, pawangi in my house, and uh, this is what remains after the charcoal is uh, consumed by the fire. Okay, there you go. Hopefully, you guys can see it. Yep. Okay, that's called ash. That's the you know, this is the mineral part of uh, of the fuel. Okay, there you go. You can see it, right? Yeah. So this would be the non-combustible part of your fuel. And virtually all fuel contains some degree of ash, okay? particularly solid fuels. Now, uh, liquid fuels contains much less uh, amount of ash, and gaseous fuels uh, virtually contains no ash. Okay. Yeah. So ash is a mineral element. Okay. So this would be um, uh, this would consist of silicon, aluminum, calcium, things like that. anything, any element that cannot be combusted. Yeah. Right. So that's ash. Okay. Uh, An approximate analysis also measures calorific value or heating value of the fuel. Okay. This is the uh, these are one and the same. Okay. Uh, some people prefer calorific fuel uh, value. Some people prefer heating value. One and the same. Yeah. Now, what about alternate analysis? So this method measures the elemental composition, okay, including moisture, again, yeah, ash, carbon. So it measures how much carbon, how much uh, elemental carbon, elemental C, is contained by the fuel, hydrogen, um, nitrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. Oxygen is typically calculated by difference. So uh, the the equipment, the analytical equipment, measures everything. Okay, C, H. N, S, okay, ash, and then it measures, it calculates oxygen by the difference to the total minus moisture, minus ash, abu, minus carbon, minus hydrogen, minus nitrogen, minus sulfur, that's the oxygen, okay? And the reason for that, it's, uh, it's technically difficult to measure the amount of oxygen directly inside of fuel, okay? So typically they're, they're, uh, they're calculated as the difference, yeah? So like silly say. Okay, uh, this is an example of what uh, proximate analyzer look like. This this unit one, uh, this one is uh, operated by PPPT. Okay, actually this one I think is is in uh, one of PPPT's lab in Jalan Sangkuriang, okay, in Bandung. Yeah, so uh, this is theoretical or stoichiometric air calculations. Yeah. Um, uh, what this page tells you are some uh, basic assumptions in theoretical error calculation. Okay, now um, you need to be careful about the the units of the quantity that you use in these um, calculation formulae. Yeah. Now, typically, fuel composition is expressed in mass percentages. Okay, of the main elements. Okay, let me highlight that one. Yeah. Typically, again, please underline the word typically. Typically, uh, fuel composition is expressed as mass percentage of these elements. Okay, so how many percent of carbon, how many percent of hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen? Okay, mass percent. Okay, again, not mole percent, but mass percent. This is the typical way of expressing fuel composition. Not the only way, but the typical way. Yeah. So these percentages are usually expressed in dry basis, yeah, or moisture and ash-free basis. 
the uh, the common industrial term for it is dry ash free basis. Okay. This means that when we calculate the percentages of C, H, S, and O, we already remove the H2O. Okay. We remove, uh, we take out the, the mass percentages of moisture and ash. Ash meaning this one, apu, not sulfur. Okay. A S H, not just S, not sulfur. Okay. Yeah. So this is uh, what, again, when we say, for example, dry basis. Okay. When we say uh, this fuel composition is expressed on a moisture free basis, yeah? it means that first you have to subtract. Yeah. Jadi kalian mengurangkan dulu, kalian mengeluarkan dulu uh, kandungan airnya, kandungan moisturenya. Ya, kemudian yang lainnya dihitung dalam basis sisanya. Oke, okay, so this is like when you calculate uh, mass balance, you have to state the basis for calculating mass and energy balance, right? Oke, okay. and the second version again, the second version is by taking out, by subtracting out the mass percentages of moisture and ash. We call that kind of approach dry ash-free basis. Yeah. Okay. Third assumption: oxygen and hydrogen are always bonded with each other. Okay. So in what water molecule, one gram of oxygen is associated with one eighth gram of hydrogen. Okay. If the fuel itself contains oxygen, so oxygen uh, in a combustion chemistry, okay, in a, in a combustion system, oxygen can enter the system both from the air, of course, obviously, right? And also from the fuel itself. So some fuel can actually contain uh, a significant amount of oxygen, yeah? So if the fuel itself contain oxygen, the mass of hydrogen that can react with externally supplied oxygen is reduced by O per eight. So remember, O here, this refers to the oxygen atom from the fuel, not from the air. Do not get confused, okay? So again, going back to here, so the um, uh, the quantity O in a fuel analysis, remember in fuel analysis, when we say O, refers to oxygen that is contained by the fuel itself, not carried into the system by the air. Okay, yeah, don't get confused. All right. So based on those assumptions, we can calculate the uh, the amount of theoretical air requirement. Okay, so one mole carbon equals to 12 grams of carbon. This requires 4.76 mole of air. Yeah. Of course, with the assumption that air, a standard air consists of 79% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. Okay, mole percent or volume percent. Yeah. One gram of carbon, uh, is then, yeah, one gram of carbon is then equivalent to 11.47, or uh, in some references, this is stated as 11.5. Yet some other sources uh, state that as 11.53. Well, you get the point. So it's about roughly it's about 11.5. Okay, 11.5 gram of air, where the molecular weight of air is assumed to be 28.9 gram per mole, right? So in a similar manner, we can calculate the amount of required air. Again, this is theoretical or stoichiometric air. Okay. So for sulfur, uh, for each gram of sulfur, we require 4.3 gram of air. And for one gram of hydrogen, uh, we need 34.4 gram of air. So if we combine everything, yeah, we will get this uh, formula to estimate the theoretical required mass of combustion air, okay, simply referred to frequently as theoretical air. Yep. So nothing surprising here. This is this all. This is all derived from basic stoichiometric calculations. Yeah. Stoichiometric reaction. Okay. So this formula uh, is used to calculate mass. Okay. The mass of combustion air. Remember, this is not volume, not mole, but this is mass of combustion air. Yeah. Okay. And now be careful here. Okay. So uh, 
the letters, uh, the quantities C, H, and O, and S in this formula. Okay, this refers to mass fractions. Yeah. Now, uh, if we go back one slide, uh, yes, typically when we uh, when we receive results of a fuel analysis from the lab, uh, we are given these units. Okay. Typically, when people report fuel analysis, they use percent mass. Okay, percent mass of carbon, percent mass of hydrogen, and so on. But in this formula, what we use is the fraction, not the percentage, but the fraction. Yeah mass fractions so be careful with these formulas okay so for example uh, let's say that your fuel contains um 50 percent of carbon okay five zero percent of carbon okay 50 percent of carbon so in this equation do not put in the, the number 50 okay but put the uh, put the number 0 0.5 okay as the you know uh, as the content of carbon yeah I'll get confused. Okay. Right. And this is how actually uh, this is how actually these uh, these values can be measured. Okay. So what I um, what I showed you earlier. Okay. This is all theoretical stuff. Okay. This is all uh, strictly stoichiometry stuff. This one. Okay. This is uh, an empirical method of measuring heat of combustion. Okay, experimental way of measuring heat of combustion, not theoretical, but real. Yeah. So standard heat of combustion is heat, com uh, heat of combustion measured at standard conditions, meaning standard methods. Okay. For example, this ASTM D 2015 method. Okay. This is a method to measure um, heat of combustion using a bomb calorie meter. Okay. This is what the call. Uh, this is what a bomb calorimeter look like. Um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, when I was your age, okay, when I when I did my uh, my undergrad degree at, in ITP, um, this one unit of bomb calorimeter in in the chemistry department, and we students, uh, well, we, we do not use it ourselves because it's a you know it's a, this is a very uh, a fairly fairly difficult to use equipment. So we just watch the. Um, uh, the lab assistant uh, performing a demonstration of how to use this uh, this instrument. Okay, I don't know about uh, I don't know if that equipment is still still exists in uh, in the chemistry department now. Okay, but uh, it used to several decades ago. <laughs> okay, and it's a pretty neat thing to watch. Okay, so uh, what we have here. Uh, so this is your sample. Okay, the sample is usually pressed into a tablet. Yeah. Okay, or put if the sample is liquid, then it is put in a standard uh, sample cup. Okay, and uh, in this sample, we insert ignition wires, ignition filaments. Okay, and the whole thing is put in a cell. The cell is called a bomb. Okay, because well, on uh, you know, on a, at a glance, it looks like a bomb. <laughs> it looks like a military bomb at, uh, at a glance. The bomb is an enclosed vessel. It's a tightly enclosed vessel. So uh, and uh, so, no material can enter or exit the bomb once it is sealed, right? So, meaning any combustion, any combustion gases will remain inside the bomb. Yeah. And then the entire uh, bomb assembly is uh, is immersed in water. Okay. So it is put in this water bath. So the blue volume here, this actually contains water. Okay. And after everything is enclosed, okay, uh, we ignite we ignite the sample inside the bomb cell by using electrical impulse. Okay, there's a spark, and then it's ignited. Uh, and the rise of temperature, the rise of temperature in water in the water bath, is calculated, is measured and calculated. Okay, so based on you know the the uh, the easy PC. Uh, as a black, okay, black principle, yeah. Uh, panas yang diproduksi sama dengan panas yang diserap. Okay, so then we can calculate how much heat was actually generated by the combustion of the sample inside the bomb. Okay, the bomb itself is not heat insulating. It's a it's a heat conducting. Okay, it's it's made from metal, so it's a heat conducting. 
Okay, uh, so it, it is not meant to contain heat inside the bomb, but uh, only the mass. The heat can be uh, the heat is transferred to the to the water, and the temperature of the water is measured. Okay, so that's how you how you measure heating value of any fuel or any material. Actually, you know, if you have a piece of <laughs> if you have a piece of instant noodle mikoreng, for example, you can measure you can actually measure the heat content of a piece of mikoreng uses this device using with this instrument. Okay, so the heating value of each element. Element, not kembang, but element. Okay, jadi uh, panas pembakaran dari setiap unsur tadi, ya karbon, hidrogen, dan sulfur, are these numbers. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? Sure. Yep. If in like real life, how do you ensure that a certain material is fully combusted, sir? Is there what? Is already fully combusted, sir. Like for example, if you just like if you use electrical impulse to just ignite something, yep. sir, for example, mm -hmm. kaya, I don't know. I feel like there may be just some remains that are not combusted. Ah, yeah. okay, okay, excellent question. Yes, and actually, uh, in a bomb calorie meter, you need to have an excess air. Yeah, I, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Uh, that's very good. So uh, inside the bomb, prior to the ignition. You need to have a, a certain amount of uh, standardized excess air, and that's all. Uh, that's all um, stipulated by this standard here. So ASTM D2015. Uh, this also uh, it also specifies how much air has to be present inside the bomb before you ignite it. You're correct. Yeah. Okay. So you, yes, sir. you're right, and it has to ensure a complete combustion. Yeah. So the amount of air. That is originally inside the bomb has to be taken into account when we calculate the heating element, uh, the heating value. Okay, that's good. Yeah. And the, uh, I think if I remember correctly, uh, if I remember correctly, this one, uh, a bomb calorie meter, actually uses pure oxygen. I don't remember, but uh, anyway, it's all uh, it's all uh, defined by this standard method. Okay, so being a standard method, then you have to follow everything by the line. Jadi karena ini metode standar, maka semua prosedur harus diikuti sesuai dengan ASTM D 2015 ini. Yeah. Including how much excess air to have before you ignite it. Okay, good. Now uh, let me end our lecture today uh, in this slide. So we have um, two bases. Jadi ada dua dasar ya. We have two bases for expressing heat of combustion. Yeah, higher heating value and lower heating value. Okay. In higher heating value, the heat produced by the combustion of a unit quantity of fuel. Uh, okay. In which water in combustion product is liquid. So uh, the the assumption in in higher heating value is that the water produced by the combustion is in liquid state. So the water is condensed. Right, if the water is condensed, the condensation of the water itself produces heat. That's why, if we state the combustion, uh, the heat of combustion, uh, where it, and we assume that the water is in condensed state, it's in liquid state, then the value will be higher. Okay, as an example for methane, this is just one example. Okay, so for methane, the high heating value is this number here. Okay, it's about um, hmm. Uh, I think, Pak Hendra, uh, could you please check if these numbers are correct? Uh, you don't have to. You don't have to answer it now. But for next week, um, yeah, but I'll have a check, Pak. Yeah, because originally it was written like this in the original diktat. Okay, and I'm not terribly sure if this refers if this comma is indeed comma. Or a point. Okay, so I'm hesitate. Uh, I hesitate uh, whether it is eight hundred and ninety comma three forty six kilojoule or is it eight hundred and ninety thousand kilojoule. So anyway, <laughs> I think it should be like this. But uh, Pandra, you can check that out. And uh, it's actually eight hundred ninety, but eight hundred ninety kilojoule so per mole should, should be comma, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me just write it like this uh, to it avoid confusion. 
and yes. uh, truncate the numbers. There you go. And also for the LHV is 885. Yep, so this would be 0.2. Yep. Unfortunately, we live in a world when where some country use point, some country use comma. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, and in, in a lower heating value, or some people call it net heating value, NHV, okay, so this, this one is HHV or GHV, right, gross heating value. This one is LHV or NHV. Uh, this refers to the heat produced by the combustion of unit quantity. Okay, so the unit quantity can be unit mole or unit mass, depending on the case, okay, in which um, water in combustion product is vapor. Okay, so the water is assumed to be remaining in water state, uh, sorry, in vapor, uh, in vapor state, and thereby the, the amount of heat produced is less than the first version here. Okay, And of course, the difference between HHV and LHV is the heat of combustion, uh, sorry, it's the heat of vaporization of the water. Yeah. This one here, there you go, yeah. So again, the difference between lower and higher heating value is of course, the heat of vaporization of the water, okay? Okay, and um, this is just a, um, this is a very general approximation, okay? Uh, so uh, if you don't have any better number, then you can estimate, uh, you can assume the heat of vaporization of the water to be these numbers. Now, as you already know from your thermal class, that heat of vaporization depends on the temperature, right? At which that vaporization occurs. So actually these numbers is not constant, but for, you know, um, uh, for the sake of uh, easiness of calculation, um, sometimes this can be assumed to be constant, okay? Okay, and oh yes, I have an announcement. So next, uh, and in the next meeting, uh, we will give you a short quiz. So this, uh, the quiz will be, will take about 15 minutes, yeah. Um, it will be counted towards your final grade. So uh, be serious with it. Uh, and we, um, you know, uh, we, uh, we regard very seriously your integrity. Okay, so please be honest when, uh, when doing the, uh, when doing the, the quiz, of course, uh, because you guys are learning in uh, in a WFH uh, form, of course, uh, the quiz will be open book, okay? But the time will be limited again, okay? So uh, there's no way for us to, to ask you to, do, to, to perform a, a closed book quiz, of course, right? But the time will be limited, yeah? Again, uh, there will be a quiz for the next meeting, which is what, tomorrow, right? So there will be a quiz tomorrow. Uh, it will be in this chapter, okay? And it will be given at the end of the class tomorrow. Yeah. So be prepared. Um, the quiz will have to be handwritten. So you you know it's not uh, you you have to work on it manually. Uh, of course, you can use calculator. But uh, what I'm saying is that you're not allowed to turn in Excel worksheet, for example. But you you know you have to perform the calculation manually. Yeah. Using calculator, uh, using Excel as a calculator is okay, but you know you do not uh, do not submit an Excel worksheet. Yeah, so it has to be handwritten, and uh, afterwards you can take you can scan it or take picture of it with your cell phone. That's fine, and then submit it to us. Okay, only fifteen minutes, so the time will be limited, uh, but it will be open book. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, and we'll see you tomorrow.